You know, why the mystery? Why the mystery? Uh, let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Father God, I thank you for this opportunity to come and share the word of God. And Lord, we just ask and pray that the minds are uh, receptive to hear that by your spirit that we can go out of here and uh, have an opportunity to share this glorious gospel with those that are lost in our families, in our neighborhoods, on our jobs, so that we can be effective ambassadors to share this glorious message to all those that are in our passing and give you all the praise, honor, and glory in doing so. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So as I was saying, this message that we're talking about today, is, it's, 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 it's so vast when you're talking about the mystery, but it's so important. It is of the utmost importance because if you realize that a lot of individuals that you have dealt with in the past and that you know are still, um, are, are still clouded or lost in not knowing what the mystery is. Traditional Christianity, there's a veil or, or a blindness upon them that they don't see this hidden wisdom that God the Father has presented to us through the finished work of Jesus Christ through the pen of the Apostle Paul. So let's begin to look at some areas of Scripture that, that coincides with what we're going to talk about today. Let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians second chapter 6 and 8. Now, I'm going to do this a little different today because I'm going to read this. We'll answer some questions. Then we're going to go over to Ephesians 3, and we'll read 1 through 9. But I actually want to read these verses for our hearing. And uh, prayerfully, we can have an opportunity to, 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 to understand some of these truths that the Word of God lays out here. So look at what it says here. In, in 1 Corinthians, we're going to go to the second chapter. Let's read. Now, I ask you to read with me verses 6 through 8. Now, we'll, I will uh, ask you, you know, kind of a few questions today. I, I want to be somewhat interactive, and those of you that are in the front probably will be at a more of an advantage as far as seeing the board, but don't worry about it if you don't. It's more, the board is more for me than it is for you, in essence. You know, I, and and one, one, one story about the board. In the background that I came from, I was always preached at. I was preached at, never shown these things. And, and, and think about it. When an individual is teaching something that has no systematic approach as it pertains to God's word, it's not laid out. They don't see the word of God from a panoramic view because they don't understand how God has laid out time past, but now in ages to come. They want to preach at you precepts and ideas and, and different here's and there's that really don't line up and match up together. So you never seen an individual actually take a board out and write on the board and show you what he's talking about and show you how it line upon line, precept upon precept, and then have the ability to rightly divide all of that once you get all those things together. That was never shown to me. So once I really began to understand the scripture and I've seen individuals like Pastor Jordan begin to lay things out on the board systematically flowing and you actually understood it and the empowerment that that gave you when you understood it for yourself. And then not only it empowered you, but empowered you to tell other people about that same message and it perpetuated itself. Because now we really knew it. It wasn't something we were guessing about. We really knew this for ourselves. So I've continued to try to always express what I'm saying through just writing it on the board. Because it helps me to stay focused because I'm, I have so much information just coming in my mind. I just want to go all over the place. But it keeps me a little focused. So we won't be so scatterbrained all over the place. So let's just read... 1 Corinthians, I mean, yeah, 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 8. Can you read this with me? It says, How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world had... For if they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Amen. Now, we're going to stay there. We'll, we're going to deal with that text because that's really the crux of what we're talking about today. But we also see a passage over here in Ephesians, the third chapter, that's going to be crucial and essential to what we're talking about as well. So let's read this in addition to it. Ephesians, the third chapter. Verses one through nine. You know, for time's sake, let's read verses 1 through 4, and then we'll, we'll come back and we'll deal with some of the verses in this, in this chapter as well. Let's read this with me as well. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, 
how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore a few words, whereby when you read my, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Amen. Now, this is something that we want to take a look at because we want to try to develop exactly what's going on as it pertains to this information being revealed to the Apostle Paul and how it affects us. How does this transfer over to you and I? And how can we actually be beneficiaries of what God has given the Apostle Paul? How does it manifest itself? What, what does the word God say about it? We're going to start right here in this passage in Ephesians, and hopefully we'll, for time's sake, get, get over to Corinthians. We'll have to deal with some of those issues in Corinthians because it is actually going to answer the question, why the mystery? and the purpose of the body of Christ and what God is doing with the body of Christ, which you and I are members of today. God is doing, do you realize that God is doing something with us today that the heavens are watching? This, and it's some, I never knew that in time past, and I, I hope you don't get time. I never knew that, but this, I, I never knew it. So now I'm excited to tell you that God is really doing something in your life, in the details of your life, based upon you renewing your mind, putting on the word of God, being transformed by the renewing of your mind and sharing this information in your day to day life. And not only sharing it, but allowing the life of Christ to live through you. You're being observed once you allow Christ to live through you. And every day it's a challenge for you to study to show yourself approved unto God as workmen who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth in order for Christ to live out of you. Because that's what God is observing. He's observing Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we'll see how this ties all in. For this cause, look at look at the Ephesians three one. This is this is beautiful. I love this. For this cause, I Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for who? That's good. You see, I'm going to ask you that type of questions all day. For who? For you Gentiles, right? See, this is something that a lot of individuals, we we cannot be ashamed of the office that the Apostle Paul has been given of God. Talks about he's the Apostle of the Gentiles, but he's been given a specific task to deal with you and I as Gentiles. He says, for this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. So that very, is very specific. There's no ambiguity there. He, uh, he's very clear in what he's saying. Now, this is something that he adds to it to give us more, more detail about what, what's going on here. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, and you, I'll, I'll keep stopping here. The dispensation of the, the, have you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God? I was in Christendom, and you have to understand what I'm saying. When you say Christendom, you're trying to get a term that's going to include everyone that names Christ, not necessarily those that are saved. You kind of see what we're saying when we say that Christendom, because they, there's a lot of people naming Christ, but there's a lot of people that's naming Christ that aren't saved. So I was in Christian dumb. And I can't say that I was saved because at that time I wasn't trusting the fact that Christ died for my sins according to scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day, exclusively that he who knew no sin was made sin, that I might be made the righteousness of God in him. I wasn't trusting that, but I was in Christendom. Because if you said something, I would say Jesus is my savior, Jesus is my Lord, but I was in Christendom, but I wasn't saved. How many of you can, can identify a little bit with me there? In the time past, that was our state. So now I see something that God is actually presenting a message that he says that the dispensation of the grace of God. And it's important. We're going to come back to what we're talking about, the dispensation of the grace of God, because it's very unique. What God is doing as it pertains to the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me, the Apostle Paul says, to who? Now, this is it. He says it's given him to you. In other words, it's given to us through the Apostle Paul. That means I'm not going to look through for Peter to see what God is telling me today. I'm not going to look to Luke. I'm not going to look to Matthew. I'm not going to look anywhere other than where the, the Apostle Paul tells me as, as it pertains to me understanding where I fit in this, this dispensation of the grace of God. And he goes on. How that by revelation, look what he says, he made known unto me the what? Here comes the mystery. Now, as much as we've been talking, he begins to let you know that that dispensation of the grace of God, he equates and now he says that 
how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. And he says, as I wrote afore in a few words. Now, we're going to put some things together here. The dispensation of the grace of God. You see this here. Well, one day I'm going to grow up and be like Rodney, and I can be able to put all this stuff on PowerPoint. I mean, he's been prom- he's he been telling me he'd do it you know, whenever you're ready, Leroy. You know, he's kind of almost tired of me, like, whenever you're ready. I'm, you know, I know you'll go up there and scribble a few things on there, but whenever you're ready, I'll show you how to get this thing. <laughs> I mean, his presentations are so tight. Now, I just thank God for Brother Rodney. I, I met him in Erie a few, few years ago, and um, he's a lovely brother. Well, we contrast these two things, the dispensation of the grace of God and the mystery. Now, look what he says here concerning the two. How that by revelation I made no, it was made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in a few words. Now, look what he says here. Whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. I want to put this here as well. Now, but this is something we have to come to a, a, a conclusion of here. He says that he wrote. I know everybody can't see this, but like I say, it's for me. <laughs> it's really for me. I mean, I'll be all over the place. I have so much information uncategorized, like a messy um, a, a folder, just all over the place, that it kind of keeps me on task with what I'm trying to share with you today. And the Word of God does it as well. That's why you just stay right to the text. He wrote a four. And this is something I like how he says this here. He says, which as I wrote a four in what? A few words. He used words, and he wrote. This is something that's so simple. See, I, I learned from a very simple mindset. Just very, just keep it plain and simple for me. And then maybe I can grasp it. But this, it, it broadens the whole arena, though. It, it broadens your understanding. The Apostle Paul is saying here very clearly how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in a few words. Now look what he says in verse 4. Whereby when you do what? You may do what? Understanding is crucial. He said that you may understand my knowledge in what? Mystery of Christ, okay? Do you realize that if you and I want to understand the knowledge, uh, the, 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 the dispensation of the grace of God, the mystery of Christ, the only way that we'll get to understand that is if we get it from the Apostle Paul's words that he wrote to us when we read them. So that sounds like real simple. Okay, you did all that to say that. Do you realize that the only way, <laughs> I mean, because this was phenomenal to me. How many, you know, as simple as that was, how many of our brothers and sisters in, you know, in different churches, if they just understood that simple premise that we just extracted from the word of God, that if you really want to know what God is doing today as it pertains to the dispensation of the grace of God, this mystery that was kept secret before the foundation of the world, this hidden wisdom that God has, the only way that you'll get to know it is if you read what the apostle Paul has written. And that encompasses all of Paul's letters, Romans through what? Philemon. Philemon. Now, we talk about this all the time. And the reason I want to reaffirm this to you is because we never get away from this. Don't allow individuals to try to infuse to you or try to gasp to you to say that you you use all the Bible as it pertains to trying to, to explain to somebody what God is doing today. The way you get to explain what God is doing today is when you go and you read the Apostle Paul and you let that develop everything else in the Bible to you. If you try to do it any other way, everything you teach will fall apart and it will not be beneficial to the purpose of God. His purpose right now on earth, neither his purpose in ages to come, which the body of Christ is involved in. You have to know and understand this because what Satan wants to do is to render you ineffective as it pertains to being um, useful of God. That's if you've already trusted the gospel. 
If you trusted the gospel already, now Satan's job for you is to render you to be ineffective because you have the power to change it for somebody else. Your, one, of your pur- one of your first and main purposes is that now you're an ambassador for Christ. Did you realize that? Because we're ambassadors for Christ, now we speak on Christ's behalf and we go to the world and express to them that he who knew no sin was made sin that we might be what? Made the righteousness of God in Christ. Now, this is something important now. With this being said, I want to share with you just just something that's a little side, but we're going to get back to the main purpose here. Turn to Romans, because in essence, the, the, the purpose for this this hidden wisdom and the purpose for this mystery and this secret and, and what it says in verse 8 of uh, Romans, the first chapter is where I want you to turn. We're going to look at verse 16 and 17. But I'm going to read this. In, in, in 1 Corinthians 2, it talks about which none of the princes of this world with, uh, knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The crucifixion is crucial to what, what God is doing with us today. And if they would have known it, they never would have crucified him. Did it say they never would have stoned him? They never would have killed him? Was that, would, that, would that have been as important? But it's important that you understand they never would have crucified him. See, crucifixion, the way he was, the way they killed God, I mean, the way they killed Christ, not God, because God can't die. You know, that's something you have to, you always got to fix that and get that right because Christ, God can die. But the way they killed Christ, it's very important that you understand that the crucifixion was essential to God's eternal purpose. It was part of God's hidden wisdom. He revealed something to Satan and Satan acted on what he revealed back there in Deuteronomy. And I'm not going to go there yet, but he, he, he revealed something to Satan and Satan took the bait. Some of you know what I'm talking about. We're going to go a little further. This is, let's go to Romans 1, 17. Romans 1, 16 and 17. Romans 1. We're going to get back to the cross here. We never get away from the cross, though, do we? We can't get away from the cross. Everything that we are is based upon what God has done for us through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And it's all encompassed around the cross of Christ, around what God has done for us through the finished work of Jesus Christ. So look at this here. Romans 1, 16 and 17. The Apostle Paul says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Now, some of you may know the power of God. You also see over here that the power of God is made reference to being something else. In Corinthians, it's also known as the preaching of the cross. Did you know that? Okay, because for time's sake, we're going to try to label some of these things here. It's also known as the wisdom of God. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, now listen, look what it says here. We're still talking about the mystery. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from what? From faith to faith. Now we're going somewhere. Stay with me here. A lot of writing here, but, you know, sometimes... Like it just does wonders for me just to see it on the board. I mean, I, I, when I was when I learned when I when I really understood it when I seen it on the board it w- it would hold my attention and I could connect it and when I took my notes I could make further notes because I understood exactly where the individual was going when when he was teaching teaching that particular precept. He says, um, "From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall do what? Live by faith." It's the mystery that allows me to understand what the word of God is making a reference to when it says that the righteousness of God, re, uh, that for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. 
Do you know that this two here indicates what we call a transition from one to another? So in other words, what the word of God is letting you know that there was faith in time past and there's a faith now that we want to take a look at and begin to understand. Do you see that this says as it is written right here in verse 17? Do you know where it's written at? Do you know that? Habakkuk. Habakkuk 2 and 4. Do you know what it says in Habakkuk? Somebody turn there. Habakkuk. See, some we're trying to quote it, but let's look, let's take a look at it. Habakkuk 2 and 4. Somebody could actually show us exactly what the difference here is, because a lot of times when we look at these things, we say that the word of God says them. But in essence, I don't think sometimes if we don't look at it for ourselves. We really won't know what was said. Habakkuk 2, 4 says, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by what? Now, see, somebody said, somebody said by faith, but somebody added and said by, this is a, this is an important item here. In time past, the word of God said that The Apostle Paul says that we should live, you know, the just shall live by faith. But when I actually went back and looked at the text, it says that he should uh, that it should be lived by his faith. And what we have to understand, this is some of the crucial things that when we're exchanging or um, telling individuals the difference between what God was doing in time past versus what he's doing right now in the dispensation, the grace of God in the mystery age that we live in today. This is some of the dynamics that is important for you and I to understand. By his faith is a direct connection to the purpose of God in his particular era and what God is doing with them. Turn to Deuteronomy. Twenty one. Deuteronomy twenty one. Look at verses twenty two and twenty three. I'll get things speeded up here in a moment. Oh, actually, that's that's the other text in my part. Deuteronomy 6. Very familiar text, in fact. Deuteronomy 6, verse 24 and 25. Now, we're talking about this contrast of faith to faith as it pertains to we're we're, going to catalog exactly what it means to be uh, and what we're talking about as far as it pertains to this mystery here. In the, t- in the faith of time past. And look what it says in verse 24. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always that he might preserve us alive as it is to this day. Now look at verse 25. And it shall be our what? It shall be our righteousness if what? If we observe to do all these things, do you realize that Christianity as a whole today still thinks that their righteousness is tied up in the things that they observe to do? And this is important. This is why the contrast between time past and what God is doing with the church, the body of Christ today in the dispensation of the grace of God is so important for you and I to be able to identify Because in time past, it was something a little different. And the Apostle Paul is cataloging and letting us know in uh, in this passage over here in Romans, the first chapter, that now therein the righteousness of God is revealed from faith here in time past to faith. 
because this is not how he's operating today. Back here, this was his faith. This was the individual's faith by the work that he did by trying to observe the law. This is what God had actually gave to the individuals to do in order to obtain their righteousness. It would be their righteousness if they observed to do all of the statutes. Are you righteous today because you observe the statutes? <laughs> Absolutely not. So it's something that's crucial and important for you and I to have an understanding of as it pertains to that. Now, this is what we're going to do. We're going to look back at what the Apostle Paul has made a reference to as it pertains to that same faith. It's very important for us. Turn to Ephesians. And in fact, turn to Romans 3. Romans 3 would be a great place to start there as we make a contrast. Now, we're still talking about the mystery of God, but we're going to contrast it as it pertains to what the Apostle Paul revealed in this hidden wisdom that he has. And this is the his hidden wisdom that the Apostle Paul. Look at Romans 3. Romans 3, Romans 3 is talking about what has been accomplished because they crucified the Lord of glory. And now because they crucified the Lord of glory, now God is extending something to us that has never been seen before, that has never been preached before, that has never been talked about before. In contrast to the way they were doing things in time past, Israel, because of the way God gave them the law and how their righteousness was accomplished. So we want to see this and we want to contrast it with what God is doing today. So we look at Romans, the third chapter, and the things that the Apostle Paul says, you'll see that they're first of its kind in the scriptures. Never would, never seen before. Romans, the third chapter, verse 21 and 22. Look what it says here. But now the righteousness of God, how? Without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Now look what it says. Even the righteousness of God, which is, now this is something key here, by faith of Jesus, amen, somebody saying it with me, Christ. And this is the cru crucial issue here, and we're going to talk about it for a moment. And, you, and it's so important that you'll see that the prince of the power of the air is trying to destroy every dynamic of what it means to be justified or made righteous because of the faith of Christ. So look what he says here. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all of them that do what? Believe. Believe, for there is no difference. It's important for, for us to understand this. So important that when we're sharing the gospel, now this is what we're sharing. We're sharing that there is a righteousness that God has come has granted to us because of what his son, Jesus Christ, provided on our behalf that is exclusive and not a part of the righteousness that Israel was trying to establish in time past. And we have to have the ability to make that division. The mystery is what gives us the opportunity to make that division because it, it really describes to us what God is doing today versus what he's done in time past versus what he's going to do in ages to come. With us knowing that, now we can go forth and begin to understand the dynamics of what God is doing. Turn to uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. We're going to deal with this for a moment. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Right in the same era of scripture, we'll get back to Ephesians here. Very familiar scripture, very, very familiar passage that we deal with quite a bit. For by grace are ye saved, how? And look what it says. And that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The gift of God, not of works, is the righteousness that God provided for you through the finished work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul is clear on stating that and showing a division in what that means. So much so, I want, to, I want you to show you how the prince of the power of air and why it's so important. And I always try to throw this in here. Why it's so important for you and I to hold fast to our King James Bibles. Because this is something that has been, is trying to be taken out. And it's being corrupted in any other version other than the King James Version. This truth is taken out of it. Now, I have the liberty of having an iPod, iPad up here. 
So I'm going to share with you what Ephesians, the third chapter in the 12th said, 12 verse says in the King James Version first. So if you go to Ephesians 3 and 12, you'll see what happened here. Actually, I'm going to start at verse 9 and come down to that because this is the this is the present purpose of the body of Christ here. Look what it says. And to make all men see what is the what? Fellowship of the mystery. Now, this is what we're doing. We're trying to make every man see what the fellowship of this mystery is. You know, the mystery is what gives us the audacity to say when somebody comes up to you and they want to know what God is doing. And we say that that's not what God is doing today. The mystery is what gives us the ability to to do that because God has separated a hidden wisdom. And we don't want to just leave it there. But in time past, you couldn't just take the word of God and say God is not doing. What do you mean God is not doing It's in the word of God, isn't it? Isn't it in the Bible? You ever heard when people say, isn't that in the Bible? You know, if it's in the Bible, they feel as though it's concrete, it's stone, right? Isn't that in the Bible, though? But it does say it in the Bible. The mystery allows us to understand that even though something is is in the Bible, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, it's not beneficial, nor does it apply to your situation. So we see that it says, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been what? Hidden God, who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now, this is what we were talking about earlier, that until the principalities and powers and heavenly places might be known unto the church, the manifold wisdom of God. And I don't like to go past that without really making a reference to just what we were talking about earlier. That right now the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be might be made known unto the church, the manifold wisdom of God. That is that and that heavenly realm. They're actually observing what you and I are doing because of what God is investing in us through the finished work of Jesus Christ and placing us in his body. So now we're 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 a spectacle unto that. Now, that's his present purpose. Now, look at his eternal purpose, according to the eternal purpose which he hath purposed in Christ Jesus, in whom we have, now this is the, the, the verse that we want to make a reference to here. Because of all of this, look what it says, in whom we have boldness and, um, and access with confidence, how? Do you know the reason I can go to God is not because I have any righteousness of my own or because I've done anything But the reason I can go before God is because the faith of who? See, that's just like Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 was talking about. It's no longer our faith. It's the faith of Jesus Christ. And it's because the faith of him. This is what we're expressing in this mystery age. The reason you I'm righteous, the reason you're righteous is not because we have any righteousness of our own. It's because of what has been accomplished for us through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And because of his righteousness, it's not because of my faith in him, but it's because of his faith that I have access to God. This is good news. But now let me show you and share with you what the another version of the word of God's This is not not of the word of God, but another version of what somebody would say the word of God says about this same verse. And I want to tell you, I want you to tell me if it sounds the same. In whom we have boldness and access and confidence through our faith in him. Is that saying the same thing? See, when you begin to direct your faith in him as being the reason you have access to God, you've missed everything that the dispensation of the grace of God is talking about. It's no longer you, but it is. It's Christ. But that's not what the other version says. So now if I try to put someone's attention to the different version or another version of of, of, of what they present to be God's word, and I tell them that it's their faith in him that gives them that justification, their faith in him that gives them that, the, the, that access, am I being correct in saying so? Will they get any truth out of that? It, it won't be beneficial to them at all. If that, in fact, is what we are doing, and that's what a lot of individuals do, they will go forth and say the faith in him rather than the faith of him. And the faith of him is a crucial matter. Philippians 3, 9. Philippians 3, 9. 
This is what we're going forth telling them. This is that, that, that this hidden wisdom. This, we're trying to make all men see the fellowship of the mystery. Having and be in, 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 in uh, Philippians 3, 9. And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is what? You remember that was that righteousness by, see, uh, his own was by his faith. That was the, that's the righteousness that people are trying to sell today. This is the wisdom of the world. It's the wisdom of the princes of this world. Because this is what the ministers of, uh, of Satan's ministers are trying to push to people today. Do you know that there's a lot of people that's out there claiming to preach the grace of God, but they're telling people that their righteousness is of the law? You know, that there's something out there called the grace revolution. There's something out there, and, 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 and it's sad to say there's something out there, and I say it because it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a ministry on national television, and it's called the message of grace as well. But they're not preaching the grace of God. The Grace Revolution, now I'll just say the name. The name is uh, 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 somebody named Joseph Prince. And, and, and the reason I want to say it, because I want you to be aware of this. He says that he's preaching the grace of God. And you might, if you turn at the right time, at the right day, he might even say the gospel. But that's dangerous when you say the right gospel one day, but within the next five to ten minutes you bring in the wrong gospel. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. When they don't understand the mystery and why it's important for us to hold fast to the sound words that are given to us in the mystery program and they want to mix things from time past and ages to come and try to make them harmonize. Listen, the Bible is not going to harmonize unless you rightly divide it. You can't make it fit and your wisdom won't do it. It's the hidden wisdom of God that will be granted to you because of the finished work of Jesus Christ that gives you the ability to spiritually discern what God is doing in the age of grace, the mystery that we know it today. And this is what God has called us to do. The body of Christ in this age is to get the information so that we can proclaim the righteousness that is not of ourselves, but it is the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus that has been given to us freely oh hallelujah look at this philippians 3 9 and be found in him not having my own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of christ the righteousness which is of god by faith now i have to again i have to share you share with you what they say and, and I want you to be able to say it because this is what you need to come up against. You need to utilize the truth that God has in you to come against the false doctrine and the error of the enemy. This is what this battle is about. It's the, it's the wisdom of this world versus the hidden wisdom that God has committed to your trust. Do you know even from the beginning in the garden, Satan, what the deal was, Satan really influenced Adam and Eve to take part in his wisdom to take part in his wisdom rather than the wisdom that was already granted to them in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Do you know what the wisdom in, in the garden was? Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And as long as they abided in not eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would be abiding in the, hit, in the wisdom of God. And as long as they did that, they would be made the wisdom of God. That's where they would sit. But it looks like you see somewhere in the world that they seen a tree that that was good to desire to make one. So they chose that they needed something other than what the wisdom that God had already given them. And they wanted to seek after another wisdom that wasn't the wisdom of God. But what we project to the world today is not the wisdom of this world that comes to naught or the princes of this world that come to naught. But we preach Christ in a mystery. The hidden wisdom of God. And I guarantee you, unless it's spiritually discerned, you won't see it. We're jumping up and down trying to figure out why don't they see it? But why don't they see it? Me and my wife was driving in the car talking about our family. Why don't they see it? I'm trying to tell them any way I can. Why don't they see it? Because it's a hidden wisdom. A hidden wisdom. A hidden wisdom. <laughs> That is only spiritually discerned. And before you get into any long, drawn-out con uh, uh, conversation with somebody about the Word of God, the first thing you want to make sure is that they are... 
Because if they're saved, now you know that they have the spirit of God where they can compare spiritual things with spiritual things. Anything else is just a conversation. It's going to be vain. It's going to be unprofitable. You can't even begin to tell them about the mystery if they don't understand that they uh, understand salvation first. I wish I had passage, one of Pastor Jordan's uh, uh, old cliche terms to throw in there uh, at the end of what I just said there so I could <laughs> tighten that up. <laughs> but it won't make a difference. They won't understand it. But I wanted to share this with you. Look at this. And be, not found, in, and, and be found in him not having my own, re, uh, own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith, through the faith of Christ, the righteousness of God by faith. Now, I wanted to share with you what another version says. And this is when I preach against or against any other version than when I'm King James Earl uh, only, because my doctrine, the, the gospel that I'm saved by can only be supported in the King James Bible. I'm sorry. No, there's no other version or in, uh, 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 translation of the Bible that will support the salvation that you understand because of the mystery of God, because of the grace of God, because of the dispensation of the grace of God, other than the King James Bible. It won't do it. Try it. And the main issue and the key issue is that now God is viewing you because of the faith of Christ has been given to you freely. And now this law is established and fulfilled in you because he fulfilled and established the law on your behalf. Oh, Hallie, we're going to look at that in a moment. I don't know what time is now. I'm, I'm going now. <laughs> Look at this. Is this. Does this say the same thing? And be found in him not having righteousness of my own, even that which is of the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. It's not saying the same thing. And it's important for us to understand that faith in Christ and faith of Christ are not the same. That faith of Christ as ambassadors for Christ, I pray that everybody understands what the faith of Christ is and what is accomplished for you. Do you know it's the faith of Christ that causes you no longer to have to worry about your salvation and whether or not it's eternal? The doctrine of eternal security do you know the fact that God justified you because of the faith of Christ is the same reason he's going to glorify you? Do you know it's not because of your ability to maintain works of righteousness by a standard of time past that God eternally secured you, but it's because of the faith of Christ. Turn to Romans 8. Romans 8. Look at verse 3 here. We're talking about the faith of Christ here in context of mystery. For what the law could not do in that it was weak, how? God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Now look what this does. That the righteousness of the law might be what? Do you know that the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in you? Do you realize that? That when God looks at his righteous standard, God has already provided that standard for you in his son, Jesus Christ. So now that the love of Christ does now constrain me. Because I am standing or abiding in a finished work that has been 100 percent provided for me by my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and given to me free of charge. And nothing that I can do can change that situation. And there's nothing that anyone can do to change what God has invested in me in the finished work of Jesus Christ to the glory of God the Father. That's something that we have to be able to effectively communicate with those that don't know that. 2 Corinthians 5.21 2 Corinthians 5 21.
I'll start at 19. I actually start at 18. First Corinthians, um, 2 Corinthians 5, 18, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. Who better to give the ministry of reconciliation other than those that have been reconciled? That's why that should always be on the top of your list. I've been reconciled. Understand that you've been reconciled because in you being reconciled, it gives you the ability to be a minister of reconciliation. Understanding, you know, you can ask somebody, are they saved? And if they're really saved, shouldn't they be able to tell you how they became saved? So as ministers of reconciliation, it behooves us to understand what God did on our behalf. To wit that God was in Christ. And this is something important, too reconciling the world unto himself. Look what, it, look what he did here. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. Do you know that God is not imputing individuals' trespasses unto them today? This is important for, for our extension as ministers of reconciliation. This is the message that the word of God is going forth with. A lot of individuals are going toward the world and they say that they're, they're on a great commission and the first thing they're telling people to do is to repent. And acknowledge your sin and turn from your sin. That's not what the mystery tells us. That's not what Paul wrote to me. Paul didn't tell me to go and tell somebody repent and acknowledge their sin. You know what Paul wrote me? Paul told me to let them know that um, that, uh, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto him. And on what basis can God tell me that God is not imputing an individual's trespasses unto them? Well, that's the good news part of it. Do you know that Jesus Christ paid for your sins? It's our gospel. How that God, that God, um, that Jesus Christ died for our sins. The sin issue has been paid for. The sin has been dealt with. There's still an issue, but the sin aspect of it has been dealt with. Don't allow individuals to muck and mire in the fact that sin hasn't been paid for. Because it's a part of our ministry as ministers of reconciliation to let them know that the sin issue is dealt with. Because of the finished work of Jesus Christ, the sin issue is dealt with. Your brother, your sister, your cousin, your next door neighbor, that person on your job, it's not the sin that's in the way anymore. God is removed. See, reconciliation didn't save the person, but it moved the enmity out the way. It moved the problem out the way. It changed the status. It allowed us to be able to preach a gospel that an individual can trust in and be saved by just believing it without any further works or any other conduct of of themselves. They could now just believe that gospel and that they could be saved by it. And their trespasses unto them and had committed unto us that word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Now look what it goes on to say. For he hath made him to be sin for us. Individuals, people don't see this. What we want to share with individuals is the fact that God made his son to be sin for you. Now, did Jesus Christ practice sin? He didn't lie. He didn't steal. He didn't commit any grievous sin you can think of. You have to understand Jesus Christ did not perform it, nor did he do it. He didn't practice it. He didn't perform it. But God, the father saw fit to still impute that sin or charge him with that sin. You have to get this. See, this is the good news. Let people know that Jesus Christ took our sin without doing it. Uh Uh-oh. I'm going to wind it down now. He took our sin without doing it. He he bare our sin. He paid the penalty for our sin. 100%. Your sin has been dealt with because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. In the same instance, that doctrine also is any other version doesn't project the doctrine of imputation. You see, it's been taken out. It's crucial to who we are and what we teach in the mystery age. Because Jesus Christ took our sin without the performance and God the Father saw fit to charge him with sin on that same basis. And this is the beautiful part about it. An individual, that worst person you know in your family, that worst neighbor that lives on your street, 
We're driven by love to tell them that God is willing to make them righteous today if they're willing to trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Do you know how wonderful that is? That they can be made righteous, not by doing works of righteousness, but by believing. Isn't that what Roman three let us know? Because we believe that now, since we believe God will make an individual righteous without his practice or his performance of righteousness. When you stand up before a holy and just God, an individual will be made righteous because the righteousness of Jesus Christ by faith of Jesus Christ has been granted to him. That's the exchange. That's what has happened today in this this dispensation of the grace of God, this mystery age. God has allowed us to be ministers of the good news that Jesus Christ finished a work for us that all we have to do in it in this age is to believe it. Believe the fact that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day according to the scriptures. And by doing so, an individual can have eternal life. Praise the Lord. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity that we've had to share. And Lord, we just pray that something was said today that will cause us to grow to a greater knowledge and appreciation of what was accomplished on Calvary's cross. Cause us to walk in our purpose as ministers of reconciliation in the body of Christ in this age that you can get the glory out of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.